Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson are two very unique characters in the digital world. They're heavyweights in the YouTube algorithm and idols to millions combined over many different platforms. They are pioneers of the social media star and could be described as the forefathers of the contemporary celebrity. For over a decade, they have been active in the online world and have grown their brand's popularity alongside the platforms they call home. They're well-traveled, well-seasoned and have connections in many industries thriving due to the hyper-connected of reality we live in today. Their influence expands beyond the people who follow their everyday lives, which has allowed them to cultivate a dedicated following while being independent of the need for that support. Understandably then, if they were to find themselves embroiled in some sort of controversy, pretty much everyone would know about it. The nature of these two men has often made this the case, as they were both built on some form of controversial image and became successful because they tend to invite trouble. So it comes as no surprise they have found themselves in hot water again, as they are at the centre of one of the most significant controversies YouTube has ever witnessed, and even more, credited with its creation. And I allowed myself to be worked by Shane, Jeffrey, and others. This video dropped at the time Shane was already receiving heat for his past actions, so it's no surprise he's remained silent since then. Oh my god! Jeffrey, on the other hand, waited 18 days to make any sort of response, and when he did, it was calm, calculated, and effectively diverted the attention away from him. And right now, outside of our walls, our world is falling apart. His return to Twitter was rather chilling, posting as if nothing had happened and downplaying the decision by Morph Cosmetics to disband any partnership they had with him and his makeup company. However, this isn't surprising. It's a common theme for Jeffrey. He's become the master of subverting criticism and shifting narratives. He's seemingly invincible to being completely eviscerated from his platform of power, and it's something that needs investigating thoroughly to understand. Because when it comes to longevity, there is an anomaly with Shane and Jeffrey, and as analogies go, they are like cockroaches in a nuclear fallout. The number of controversial things they have done, the lack of accountability they have taken, as well as the fact the scale of the backlash they have received would destroy anyone else's reputation, they have survived so much. Jeffrey seems to have evaded entirely any responsibility for his recent shenanigans, the jury is still out on Shane, but historically, they have managed to survive so far in a climate that should altogether reject what they represent. So how have they managed to keep such a dedicated and unwavering following? How have they been able to dodge responsibility with subpar apology videos? What is the deal with their relationship, and what is the actual reason behind its formation? These are some of the questions we will be asking over the next three parts, and hopefully, come the end of the series, we will have provided enough context to be able to achieve a comprehensive profile of what Jeffrey Starr and Shane Dawson represent in this digital world. So, join myself and Bill Hello. as we begin this journey from the beginning, through the past and into the present, as we investigate Jeffrey Starr and Shane Dawson. So, it's crazy, 16 year olds don't know about MySpace. Yeah. They have no clue. I'm tired of everyone talking shit. Everyone thinks they can get away with it. But in reality, that Glock in my car might need to be put to use. And I never know how far to take stuff, or how can I joke with kids that way? I don't know. I'm telling you, this kid's gonna do it. He's gonna do it. Jeffree Star. Uh, this video is not me defending myself. This video is me apologizing because I understand why some people think that. I said really horrible, vicious things back to people to hurt them. Jeffrey had texted me a few minutes prior, and I opened my phone to this. You need the internet taken away from you. You are a danger to society. I have had an insane, crazy past, and all the stuff that I've said I will be sorry for until the day I die. The Jeffree Star of today was born many, many years ago, in a time when social networks were in their infancy and society was only beginning to tap into the blossoming potential of a digital world. Jeffrey, born Jeffrey Steininger Jr., grew an appreciation for makeup at an early age. And my mom had this huge makeup train in her bathroom, just full of drawers, and I just remember um, going in there one day and pulling them all apart and picking out eyeshadows and glitters, and she had these little pigments that she had collected. According to him, across many interviews, when he finished school at the age of 17, he left his home to chase his dreams in the untamed streets of 
Los Angeles. He found himself a job at a MAC cosmetics outlet, from there expanding his coffers by attending Hollywood clubs with his fake ID, grabbing himself celebrity clientele willing to pay him for home makeup appointments. The early LA days were very prosperous for him, often splashing out on expensive designer brands. However, at the same time, he was making moves that would eventually lead him to significant success. Jeffrey's early adventures in the digital world consisted of various forum-style websites which are the ancestors of the contemporary social media we all engage with today. In a few interviews, Jeffrey mentioned several early websites he had used, the most interesting being one called facethejury.com. The site allows users to post images of themselves and have other users rate them. Apparently, he had been using the site since 99, but the earliest I could find any existence of an account he had was in 2002. Appropriately named Cunt, he had a picture of himself wearing an all white aesthetic, rocking the white hair and outfit. His about me is intriguing, well, everything about it is, yeah. This was of course one of the many sites he had used in his early internet days, but the real journey he would embark on began in October of 2003. MySpace. It's something that many of the older viewers may fondly remember, and those born within the new millennium probably have never heard of. In short, it was a precursor for most social media platforms and was wildly popular during the noughties, and it was also the site that Jeffrey would soon become very popular on. Through 2004 and into 2005, there's not much to really show for his activity on MySpace. There's the activity for Face the Jury, but more interestingly, here's his activity on another website called Melodramatic. Here is a blog post of Lipstick Nazi, a splash page for an upcoming live journal profile he was going to release. As you can see, this image is censored. That's because, trigger warning, he had self-mutilated and used that as his brand, if you will. He did actually comment on this in June 2020 and claimed that he had removed it from the internet. Just keep that in mind because this will come back quite soon. However, as we come into the later part of 2005, Jeffrey appears in what could only be described as his first ever interview. And now I present to you the one and only Jeffrey Starr. Welcome to Arnold Salvation. Hi, thanks for having me. In November of 2005, Jeffrey made an appearance on a late night internet show called Oral Salvation. Jeffrey's presence was a catalyst for the show to become rather popular. In a 2015 memoir, the host Reverend Mitch says Jeffrey gave the show a massive boost, propelling its popularity by thousands of viewers a night. Yeah, I know, Orgy. I went to the show and this mom was in my way and I was like, excuse me, and she like said some comments to me so I beat her with my purse. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That's that's amazing. Are you really turning 17? Yeah, actually. <laughs> November 15th is my birthday. I'll be 17. Of course. I don't know. It was like an I'm obsessive compulsive, so I like tried it out one day and then I went crazy. I started doing it for pictures. Like there's an art there's an art gallery show of me me just slitting my wrist in every photo. You missed out. I'll give you a copy. All right. 2006 was the year that Jeffrey had his significant blow up. The success of his early music and the conversion of his MySpace account into a music profile attracted swathes of people wanting to be his friend, making him one of the most popular users on the site. At the time, he was still working at Mac and also as a freelance makeup artist, serving the many celebrity connections he had made socializing in clubs. In one story, he would supposedly go on an impromptu adventure to the Brit Awards so he could paint Kelly Osbourne for the event. His popularity grew with the development of his music that he would release onto his page, including songs such as Ice Cream and Plastic Surgery Slumber Party, of which debuted during an interview on DJ Rostar's punk rock show in August. First question of the day, are you a guy or a girl? You don't remember? I have no idea. Good answer. Jeffrey's early interviews are an interesting insight to the way he presented himself back in his early MySpace days, and some of the things he talks about in these interviews would definitely be criticized today. The craziest thing someone has done when they've met you. I want to know this. Um, this one girl carved my name in her arm with a razor blade. Like your full so, name, so, Jeffrey Star. Several people have done that. I have it all saved in my computer, yeah. And do you ask them why? Are you flattered or what's the reaction? To that? I mean, because I, like, I used to be a cutter when I was in high school. But I wasn't this people that wanted attention. It was like a secret. So I, I'd always talk about that in like, my, my like, live journal on all the sites in high school. So maybe they think I don't think it's cool or something. But and they're just doing it to pretty much to show you. I guess. They had, they had so much love for me. 
Similar to his interview on oral salvation, Jeffrey offers a rather relaxed commentary on self-harm and his experience with it. However, his response to others sending him pictures of them cutting his name into their arms and then saving them on his computer is quite disturbing. He had an audience consisting of mostly young teenage girls and a lot of them wanted his attention. By saying he keeps the images people sent, it would have most likely encouraged more of this to happen. This is rather contrary to his comments today suggesting he scrubbed any and all sorts of this type of imagery. Another key appeal of Jeffrey was his no bullshit attitude and there are countless examples of him resorting to violence in his earlier days. He has a combatant personality, and if anyone crossed him or underestimated him, they would soon know how wrong they were. Has it gotten to that point yet? Besides yeah, the mom? I'm in a jail three times for assault, just so everyone knows. 2007, and this is Jeffrey's big year. In March, he released his first EP, Plastic Surgery Slumber Party, consisting of all the songs he'd released on MySpace. Moving into May, he was profiled by the alternative magazine LA Weekly and discussed the ins and outs of being MySpace famous. This article highlights the edgy side of Jeffrey and really puts his 2020 statement into question. Uh, let me just read you this excerpt. Star wants to show me a few he and photographer Heidi Calvert took back then, so we go to his pink bedroom where, as promised, there is indeed a tattooed limbed boy wrapped in Hello Kitty sheets. The picture hanging above the vanity where Star's makeup brushes live shows him as a blonde in fishnets and hooker heels with slit wrists, blood smeared up his forearm, and a tissue spotted with blood in his other hand. Oh, and it was all real, girl, he says, showing me the scars in his wrists. Heidi wanted me to hold a gun in my mouth and I was like, fuck that, I took a razor and slashed my wrists, so I got a weird cult following. As you can see, a consistent trend emerging from these interviews is the focus on Jeffrey using self-mutilation as an aesthetic and the disturbed response people had to it, a cult following of people who appreciated the aesthetic of self-harm. The fact Jeffrey kept this is rather questionable, especially when he made it seem like he tried to scrub it from history. However, whatever his reason was, it was effective in building this divergent image he had gained popularity from. Following this article, he would attend the Toronto Pride Festival in June, where he performed on the 23rd. An article written during the event detailed a situation that occurred once Jeffrey had finished his act. During his performance, there had been audience members launching projectiles at him, and once finished, he had tracked them down and confronted them. The article says he assaulted a 17-year-old girl who was simply accused of flipping him off, and as a result, the event organizers banned him from attending the remainder of the festival. But before she it really hits the fan. Here's a look at Jeffrey on LA Yink with his good friend Kat Von D. Uh, before shit hits the fan between them. I don't know if like my ex is sad or what, you know? You haven't like really dealt with it emotionally. Orby's on tour for three weeks, so I think it'd be a good time for Kat to, you know, really like step back and look at everything. And the way that I feel about Orby, I'm like, I really like him and I don't want to pass it up. Everybody likes him, dude. Yeah. You like him. I, know. I don't like anyone. I, don't I like know. Him. <laughs> <laughs> and Ludwig loves him, you know? Yeah. Orby. Towards the end of 2007, Jeffrey became acquainted with a character who would soon become one of his worst influences, and arguably become one of his greatest regrets. Towards the end of the year, he would begin associating with a skit maker known as Charolade, who was very active in publishing short sketches on MySpace. In a now infamous video that was posted on Jeffrey's YouTube channel, they participate in a phone call sketch as stereotypical ghetto women. You say black folk cannot wear MAC cosmetics and you splash your ass in your face. Well, maybe if she wasn't wearing the wrong foundation color, I wouldn't have to splash no battery acid. I wanted to lighten her skin tone, girl. What was seen as hilarious for Jeffrey's audience was and always has been racist. At the time, comments on a gossip forum took note of this and called him out for his racism before it would become a popular thing to do a decade later. Because it's not just this video that was racist, as Cheryl Aid made many racially stereotyped videos, including many blackface sketches. The common notion that the internet was more edgy back in this time doesn't justify the videos in any way. It was shock humor lacking the humor so people could try and get easy views. It's being racist for the sake of being racist, and it carried on for a few months. Cue the next load of archived videos. Jeffrey's association with Cheryl Aid stains his timeline from late 2007 into early 2008. Archives show that they had spent a good amount of time together, so it would be very interesting to know what they would say when the camera wasn't rolling. 
Only they have the answers for that question, but unfortunately Charolette has since vanished from the internet, so we can only guess as to how they would speak in private. What's more is that you would expect a little bit of maturity from someone in their early 20s, but what can you really expect from someone who spent their late teens living life without rules? Jeffrey is truly the original social media star. Jeffrey's next adventure will take him around the world. Building on the success of his MySpace music and his large dedicated following, he will begin to focus on his career as a musician. He was already going on tours with the people who he had made friends with, however, the focus on actually producing music had become his priority. In March, he was interviewed by another LA-based magazine and offered more insight behind the man taking the internet by storm. He talked about a social network site he was using called Buzznet, which was described by its owner as a music and pop culture community, so Jeffrey fit right in. He discussed how he found the site and his relationship with a girl named Hannah Beth, of whom he had a back and forth relationship with. I do regret spray painting bitch on Hannah's car, and she keep my car and slash my tires. <laughs> Although things were looking up for him, he still maintained his controversial and aggressive personality because According to him, that's who the real Jeffrey was. In this interview, he was also asked about whether his lifestyle would exist without the internet. Between April and May, Jeffrey performed on his first full-length headlining tour called the Will Steal Your Man Tour. When he was in Texas, a high school news show interviewed him at one of his gigs at the White Rabbits in San Antonio. I'm here with Queen of the Internet and soon to be Queen of the World, Jeffree Star, who is current <laughs> hey everyone! He's currently on the J-Star Will Steal Your Man Tour with uh, Breathe Carolina, Dr. Manhattan, and the Schoolyard Heroes. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, Jeffrey, tell us about a little bit about the tour. Has it been awesome so far? A lot of fun? Yeah, I've never really done like a full-length tour, so I was kind of nervous. I was like, ooh, how am I going to get ready every day? But it's been so much fun. We've had crazy moments on the tour. Two days ago in Houston, I got to mace someone on camera. <laughs> my, my fantasy was complete. Awesome. <laughs> 2008 also saw Jeffrey start his own record label. As of August 27, he had founded Popsicle Records, which a few months later would be used to release his new EP, Cupcakes Taste Like Violence. Following the registration of his business in September, according to Jeffrey, he was arrested at the Hollywood Burbank Airport for what I assume was possession of some sort of weapon. This was in a blog post from the time. He said he was given a weapons felony charge and was released on bail for $20,000. Unfortunately, due to geographical disadvantages and the restrictions surrounding California arrest records, I cannot verify the many occasions where Jeffrey has supposedly been charged. So it may just be him trying to make himself look a little bit more interesting. Again, if we want to verify this, it's really down to whether he wants to dig out the receipts. 2009 was another big year. Jeffrey dropped his first and only album, Beauty Killer, in September, and a few months before, he was on the Vans Warp Tour, which he called a massive success. Hi. Hi, Sue, that's me. However, as with all things Jeffrey, there were controversial incidents that happened during the tour. In a clip that would resurface many years later, Jeffrey is seen assaulting one of the tour's crew members. How was your show? I missed you. I missed you. How was your show? Oh. You're not, you're not oh, nice to me. I knew it was big. I we knew it. The man who Jeffrey and his friend inappropriately touched showed clear signs of discomfort, and that's not okay. Even if it's not assault, it's still sexual harassment, which is becoming a very important topic for discussion now as many people are coming out and accusing him of doing the exact same thing around the same time. As well, if the person who they had touched was indeed a part of the crew, that is highly unprofessional of Jeffrey to do so. But of course, shit happens. There's not a lot we can do now other than reflect on it, understand the issues with it and hold him accountable for his actions. Quickly dipping from 2009, the start of the next decade saw Jeffrey head on a world tour to promote his new album, featuring the brand's Broken Side and their infamous Blood on the Dance Floor. From an interview with a music website in May of 2010, Jeffrey detailed what it was like being on tour and the difficulties he faced with the personnel he had with him. The common irk facing Jeffrey was the short life of many band members due to their preference towards alcohol and being unable to control their behaviour with it. As is evident, Jeffrey is still one with the character he was in his early days. However, in the time he has been in a somewhat serious profession, he's grown to make moral decisions based on the impact they have on his time and patience. The businessman Jeffrey is so ruthless. 
He can handle you if you run down the street and call people racial slurs and sexist insults, or he can handle you if he can punch you in the face. But please, for the love of everything, no alcohol. Except when it's funny to make fun of people who are passed out. Get it out, girl, get it out. <laughs> now that, that passes the vibe check. In this interview, he also discussed the band he was currently traveling with and had this to say about them. Well, the drummer doesn't drink. The guitar player is cool. I fired my keyboard player after Europe. He threw up everywhere one night and was like, blacked out drunk. He started shaving his pubic hair in front of 14 year olds with his dick out. That's disgusting and obviously illegal, so he had to go. I couldn't deal with that anymore. Well, of course, when someone fronts a child and decently exposing themselves to said child, you would very much hope that you don't associate with that person anymore. Which is interesting, because after his tour concluded, and they had then embarked on the Looking Hot and Dangerous tour, he released a tweet saying the lead vocalist of Blood on the Dance Floor, Davi Vanity, had done illegal acts with minors, claiming he was no longer going to associate with them anymore. However, it's rather convenient for him to make noise after the fact they had finished touring, because pockets outweigh the need to distance yourself from predators. Gotta get that bread. Okay, but wait a minute. After this call out, Jeffrey retracted his statements a year later, and then went ahead and continued associating with this person who had been accused by multiple young girls of being a predator. In fact, he would even go as far as working with the group yet again, as you can see from this footage during the 2012 Warped Tour. It's impossible to understand the rationale during this time because it's all very hush hush and not many people really understood what was going on. But the fact Jeffrey went from publicly exposing Vanity as a predator to then backtracking on that a year later just so he could go tour with them again is rather peculiar and opens up a lot of questions for later on in the series. So we'll just stick to the timeline. Now, other than the slight inconveniences for people who shouldn't be allowed within 500 meters of a school, 2010 was pretty wild for Jeffrey. He had a pretty awesome cameo in a friend remake of Kesha's Take It Off. And he was also signed by Akon's label Convict Music, the same label that had found Lady Gaga and pretty much turned her into an instant star. In fact, two years later, this is what Akon himself had to say. So is there anybody new that you guys coming up that we should be looking forward to that you could tell us right now? Well, a lot of people always wonder, they'd be like, well, after doing something like Gaga, like, what's next? Like, can he do it again? Well, I did it again. Listen, if you never heard of Jeffree Star, Google him. She know. Jeffree Star is next. I'm telling you, this kid is going to do it. He's going to do it. Jeffree Star. Jeffrey was now about to rocket to the top. Convict was co-owned by Interscope, a subsidiary of the Universal Music Group. He was now a major name in the market. He's got this big record deal, which he would move on to release a few more songs for. But shortly after, towards the end of 2013, he quit music altogether. And it's no offense to him because he's a good person. He's just not good at business. Mm. Right. You know, he had a hit song and all of a sudden it turned into 20 hit songs and mm. Grammys and you're signing Lady Gaga and T-Pain. And I think he just had so much success quickly. You know, he, he was never a business person. Right, right, right. He was a street, you know, like trapper that right. got success. So um, he didn't really know how to handle me. He thought he knew what he was doing. But, um, you know, he was kind of going down a dark path when I signed on, but I didn't know that. The Akon fallout ended Jeffrey's music career before it could truly take off, and at the same time, the legacy of the MySpace powerhouse would inevitably trickle away into a distant memory. In over a decade, Jeffrey had risen from a vocal, divergent teen making his name on small, early networking sites to being the personal makeup artist of Hollywood elites. He grew a small, scattered following into a large, dedicated audience, being regarded as one of the most popular names on MySpace in its prime. He used that audience to build a music career and for seven years grew in popularity and notoriety. And now that's all over. Hello, my name is Bill Baines and I helped BWC research a good chunk of this three-part project. And I'm here to talk to you about the early career and controversies of Shane Dawson. Now Shane would start his channel all the way back in 2008, producing comedy sketches including stereotypical, exaggerated and blackface characters. In an era where being edgy was attractive to marginalised young people, the internet was kind of a hub of 
racist, homophobic, and transphobic content. Some for malicious purposes, some just because people wanted to have a laugh. By 2010, he had half a billion views and was one of the first YouTubers to gain that much popularity, says one blog post by Jessica Schwartz, which can be widely attributed to his offensive comedy star. From 2008 to 2010, Shane would play at least 26 separate characters in a string of videos, including celebrities such as Randy Jackson, Simon Cowell, and Barack Obama. In 2010, Shane would be named in the top 25 most famous internet celebrities. With Forbes writing, he's become an online comedy idol and over 1.2 million people subscribe to his YouTube channel. His videos have been watched more than 204 million times and Dawson's parody of the new Twilight movie alone has drawn more than 5.4 million viewers. In the same year, Shane won the Streamy Award for Best Vlogger and the Teen Choice Awards Web Star of the Year. According to Business Insider, by September 2011, Dawson's channel was the fifth most subscribed to YouTube channel behind Ray William Johnson, Niga Higa, Smosh, and Machinima. From 2013 all the way up until 2017, Dawson would produce a podcast called Shane and Friends, releasing as many as 140 episodes, featuring many fellow YouTubers such as Lily Singh, Gabby Hanna, and Jesse Wellens. We'll get into that a little bit later. He also directed and starred in the 93-minute comedy film Not Cool, which was released in 2014 with a budget of $800,000. It would draw in just $36,000 from the box office. One critic wrote, Not Cool is a cautionary tale of how being able to make YouTube videos that go viral does not necessarily make someone a filmmaker. Whilst another user stated that they didn't laugh throughout the entire movie, but laughed when they looked up the box office and budget statistics. In 2015 and 2016, Dawson released two books, I Hate My Selfie and It Gets Worse, a collection of essays, which at the time would be the number one debut week book sales for any YouTube star. Hey It's Millie is a channel developed by the Fine Bros in association with Dawson, who, according to Wikitubia, features a character who is uh, eight years old. She often makes sexual remarks, advances, and comments towards Dawson's character, who is clearly a lot older, and it, it is referenced that these are inappropriate jokes to be making. That they decorated saying, touch me. Is this the right way to do it in a good way? You could be a little more gentle. You know what we could do, Millie? What? Motorboat! What's motorboat? <laughs> so Millie, you a fan of the D? Are you talking about your big dick? What does dick mean? What? No! I was talking about D, like DZ. Man, where did you learn how to talk like that? From watching Selena Gomez. Selena Gomez? Yeah, and Guy Carly. She's so cool and attractive. I love the way her hair flows down her back and brushes over her tight ass. Oh, that shit's so hot. And you know her and her butch friend experiment. I mean, wouldn't you, DZ? Oh, oh, and her newly developed breast. They're speaking to me. They're saying, hey, hey, Millie. Do you want to suck on us? Ooh. Hey, 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 Shane? Well, is it wrong to touch yourself in the nether regions? Hmm? Hmm? Shane? <laughs> um, Shane? Shane, can I, ask, can, I, can I ask you a question, Shane? What? Shane? Will you fuck me? <laughs> um, Shane, Shane, wait, follow up question? What? What? What does fucking mean? <laughs> Shane? It's fucking bad. <laughs> why don't you, uh, why don't you touch yourself a little bit? Um, what do you mean? Like my face? Wait, you're not moving your lips. Oh. <laughs> like my face? Like my face? <laughs> no, touch a little, a little lower. Like my underdeveloped breast? That's a brief deep dive into the Shane Dawson's early career. I'll return later to talk about the controversies, but for now, back to BWC. The end of Jeffrey's last chapter opens a new one, one that will completely change his direction, attitude, and try to reinvent who he is. Once he had finished his music journey, he didn't sit back and withdraw from the spotlight, and thus began a transitional period and a very big leap in responsibility for him. In 2014, he risked it all on a project just so he could follow his passion and achieve something he could have only dreamed of. Music wasn't his passion. His journey has always revolved around makeup, so the next logical step he would take was one into the cosmetics industry. He was already rather successful at selling products, his merchandise sold very well, but stepping into a multi-billion dollar industry that was only expanding was no small feat, and he put all his money into developing 
Jeffree Star Cosmetics. The company was officially registered in California on the 25th of August 2014, and he would release his first line of lipsticks in November of the same year. A popular story Jeffrey likes to tell is that he is self-made, that he invested everything to build himself up from nothing. He even beefed with a 10-year-old Mason Disick earlier this year after the kid called him spoilt. Because Jeffree Star is like spoiled AF. <laughs> Wait, let me- oh, whoa. I almost just spilt hummus everywhere. James is like very nice. However, I think his rags to riches story is a little bit of an exaggeration. The company was founded with another person and their name is Ashley Avildsen. What I didn't know until I had a look is that Ash is quite well of himself and owns the Sumerian Records label, which represents a variety of progressive type bands and artists. He was listed as a managing member when the company was founded, so I don't think it's too far of a reach to assume that he made investment for a stake in the company. The business relationship here is also rather interesting, because at some point within his music career, Jeffrey would have met Ash and they would have struck together some sort of connection. This could have possibly happened during a warped tour, as music executives frequently attend these to not only see their talents perform, but possibly scout others. However, what I take from this is that the foundations of his company were built on the idea of the past Jeffrey, the person that was supposedly going to be left behind. At the time, this doesn't mean much, but later on it will mean so much more. So the debut of his company came in the form of three different shades of velour lipsticks that he would sell for $18 a stick. The claim he makes is that he invested all of his savings into 30,000 units of product, there's no mention of any of the investment money, that's if there was any. The company was obviously not in the retail market at this time, so it was just e-commerce, meaning he launched the products on his site. Within minutes, they sold out. It was a success. I estimate that they would have made $540,000 given there were no hiccups, and that's a pretty solid return for your first release. Jeffrey says he used the profits to go again, investing in more shades as well as PR material to promote his new brand. But in 2015, he found an even better way to do this. He started posting makeup tutorials representing his makeup line on YouTube. And this is the beginning of Jeffrey 2.0. From then, it was all about expansion. Of course, they would strike a partnership with Morph Cosmetics, and Jeffree Star Cosmetics was now in the retail market. This partnership with Morph sent his products into stores worldwide and expanded the reach his company had in the cosmetics industry. The company was thriving. In 2016, Jeffrey Cohen joined with what I assumed was investment in the company to allow them to reach into more markets and continue expanding, which also attracted some unwanted attention. In 2017, Jeffrey faced a couple of lawsuits from other cosmetics companies for IP-related infringement. One company, Black Moon Cosmetics, alleged that Jeffrey and Manny Moore had copied their logo design. The other company, Lunatic Cosmetics, alleged that Jeffrey had completely ripped off one of their makeup lines, as well as copying the promotional material for it. I mean, it's very hard to deny the similarity here. From what I saw, both of these cases were settled, so... I assume there was a good sum of money exchanged. Jeffrey does love a good bit of controversy. Welcome back. Now, over the years on YouTube, Shane Dawson has been called out time and again for his old videos, particularly in 2014, where he was criticised for racism, blackface and offensive videos from just a few years prior. In an apology from that year, Dawson explains his use of blackface to play celebrities such as Chris Brown, Wendy Williams and Will Smith, claiming he was ignorant to the history of blackface. He says he isn't racist and that he was just uneducated on the subject, saying that he used blackface to maintain the aesthetic integrity of the characters. Basically what happened was some screen caps were going around and some blog posts about me doing blackface. I, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't really know what it was up until literally a month ago. Um, I knew the term, but I didn't quite know any of the historical, you know, background and, and all, any of that. Um, I just knew in my head, I was like, that's not what I'm doing. Because what I'm doing is I'm playing Wendy Williams, which a lot of the screen caps that are going around are of me playing Wendy Williams and me playing Raven Simone and Chris Brown and stuff. So for me, in my head, I was just like, oh no, I'm just becoming the character. I'm not making fun of them for being black. I'm just looking like that, using bronzer, making myself look like, how are you doing? Like Wendy. 
One article from The Time criticizes Shane's use of the stereotype and race, saying characters like Fruit Loop, Shanene, and SDZ relied on, you guessed it, lazy cultural stereotypes of women of color. The article continues, Art Hilda is the main character in a parody of the Katy Perry's The One That Got Away, called The One That Turned You Gay. Ironically, the title of the song would be one of the major allegations and memes to be levied against James Charles in the 2019 during the infamous drama Get It. The article rallies a scathing attack, describing how one character drugs her co-star, offers her up on Craigslist, and except from a man accepting to kill her. Ariel Dahin writes, this is not utilizing humor to disempower disturbing imagery. This asinine display normalizes imagery of brutal sexual abuse and date rape. You might say this article is ahead of its time because in 2020, uh, more allegations of Dawson's disturbing videos be presented across Twitter, resembling a somewhat similar argument. One of the characters played by Shane Dawson, Shanene, is a light-skinned ghetto girl, which plays on stereotypes creating an uneducated criminal and poorly mannered character. Dawson emphasizes these characteristics repetitively in his videos for comedic effect, making light of insults that are often used against people of color. Have you considered doing drugs? Yeah, I smoke weed all the time. <laughs> I said drugs. What are you, in kindergarten? Kindergartners smoke weed? Hell yeah, my dealer's 12. Shanene, here's your weed. Ooh, thank you, sweetheart. Girl, have no fear. Shanene and Jerquan are here, and we about to pimp your prom. Your new prom date. This is Tyrone. He was just in prison for rape of a minor, but he got released on bail, so tonight he is all yours. I'm gonna fuck this bitch up. Keep, keep. <laughs> this is the best prom ever. Prom? Ain't going no motherfucking prom. Are we really doing that now? You don't think he's cute? It's like we's twin. Okay, girl, the only thing me and you have in common is that we both had sex with Ray J and we both caught his crabs. Ray J didn't have crab. He didn't? Then who'd I get mine from? Uh-oh. Ding. What are you doing? No. No! <laughs> Y'all didn't see that. Whoa! That reminds me of the thing that my dad used to shove in my mouth when I was three! Mm, mm, memories! Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> for some, Shane is trivializing their experiences of racism as nothing more than jokes for a YouTube video. In 2014, a creator by the name of Demi Says Stuff would explain why they think it isn't okay for Shane to make these jokes. When a black person stands in front of a black audience and points out the humor that can be found in just existing in a society saturated in the insidious specter of institutionalized racism and the bottomized masses who perpetuate it, that feels good. Because everyone can laugh and break the tension and find the silver lining in the bullshit we have to deal with every single day. Even though the humor might be crass, we know that the person performing it understands the pain beneath it and how important it is to be able to laugh. The performer is right there with us. We're laughing together. It's an exchange. When Shane Dawson does it, it's not an exchange. He doesn't get it. He hasn't been there. He's not black. So he's not black, but that's not even it because he has no interest in learning about the lives and the history of blacks. I say that as fact because if he did, he wouldn't fall back on those old, tired, offensive, apish stereotypes to portray black characters in a humorous way. For me, in the end, it's not even that you use racist stereotypes for comedy. What really pissed me the fuck off was the fact that you used ignorance and the privilege of celebrity to make it okay. But most importantly, what the f*** are you gonna do in the future? Blackface was used by white people before it was socially acceptable for people of colour to do acting, to portray themselves as a person of colour, often playing into racial stereotypes at the time. It was used for a long time to substantiate the criminalization of African Americans in order to discourage the African American rights movement. Uh, this means that in particular areas of the world, this practice was used to oppress people of colour from gaining equal rights and getting social change. Whilst playing characters, he has said the N-word, most notably calling fellow creator Shannon Malcolm monkey and the N-word as part of a video. This pie is so good, monkey woman. My name is not monkey woman. 
Hari, monkey woman. Little number, big monkey woman. Haven't you ever had a nickname before? Well, you folks did call me nigga, bitch. <gasps> you have two nicknames? Now you're just bragging, nigga, bitch. Oh, nigga, bitch, monkey woman. You're the best. The word of the day is... Nigga! If a video ain't funny at all, I'm gonna delete that shit. Nigga! For Shane Dawson to do blackface while emphasizing racial stereotypes, many people see this as a resemblance of the old oppressive ways of the media and society during the African American rights movement. For many people, they see this not as comedy, but as an act of oppression. In September 2014, Cheska Lee, now Francesca Ramsey, would call out Shane Dawson saying this. Blackface is just one element that I and a lot of other people took issue with, including racial slurs, stereotypes about all different types of people of color, not just black people, in addition to inappropriate jokes about people who have been killed because of racially motivated crimes. And what's incredibly troubling is that those same stereotypes that are used for comedy purposes are used to justify the killing and mistreatment of black people and other people of color. Thugs, drug dealers, robbers, prostitutes, angry, dangerous. These are not just jokes. Words mean things, especially when you have an audience of millions, not hundreds, not thousands, millions of impressionable young people that don't understand the power of these words and don't understand the institution of racism at all for that matter. During the more recent cancellation of Shane Dawson in 2020, Jaden Smith, son of Will Smith, called out the creator for doing blackface, saying, as a youth, we need to support creators who support us and our morals. One of the most notable videos circulating online is footage of Shane Dawson imitating masturbation in front of a poster of what was an 11 year old Willow Smith the daughter of actor Will Smith. Following this video going viral, Jane Smith slammed Dawson saying, I'm disgusted by you. Sexualizing an 11 year old girl is the furthest thing from funny. Then joined by Willow's mother saying, I'm done with the excuses. Another couple of clips have surfaced where Dawson talks about underage celebrities in a sexual manner, talking about a 16 year old Justin Bieber doing pornography and making inappropriate comments about Rebecca Black's breasts. All right, on Twitter, I asked you guys if Justin Bieber decided to be a porn star, what would his porn star name be? Here are some of my personal favorites. Justin Bieber, <laughs> Justin Queefer, Just In My Mouth, and Thrusting Beaver. And there was even some ideas for porn movie titles, and I can't decide which one is my favorite. I'd tap it one time, or one less lonely asshole. <laughs> what do you think, Justin? Which one do you like? I like them both. You know what, Justin? How about we make both? What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Perfect, JB. I'll be over soon. Who's Rebecca Black? Are you fucking kidding me? You fuck. If I had a gun, like that guy back there. You mean that little girl you met in the video that your mom introduced you to? With the huge tits? Yes. Oh, yeah. Her. She's like 11 teen, right? <laughs> if Rebecca Black was drunk. And then he said, I live for your Rebecca Black obsession. And I said, I know, Queen. And then they were talking about something. And then I sent them this picture. That's me with the spit coming out of my lips. A large creator back in the day was Fred Is Dead, who, in the upcoming clip, was apparently underage. I have a kind of a good story, I think, about him. So, okay, it was like five years ago. I haven't even talked to him about this. It was like five years ago, and he followed me on Twitter. And he's like, oh, I saw your Fred Is Dead video. I'm like, oh, cool, whatever. And then he goes, so do you want to like talk on AIM? I didn't have an AIM, uh -huh. but I said yes, and I made one. And then he started, we started talking, and I was maybe 19, and he was probably like, honestly, like 15, I don't know. Uh -huh. And um, he was just like, yeah, you live in LA? I'm like, yeah, he's like, where? And I was like, North Hollywood. He's like, oh, I'm here right now. I'm like, at a hotel. And I'm like, oh. And he's like, yeah, we should like hang out. It was like one in the morning. I was like, oh. Mm. And then I was like, oh, isn't that kind of weird though? And he goes, he's like, no, it's cool. It's just my sister, and she's cool with anything. She's asleep. I was like, what's happening? So I told my mom, who was like watching Nancy Grace, I was like, mom, I think Fred is trying to fuck me. And my mom's like, I'll drive. And, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay, that YouTube Monty. Um, so, then, so then I was just like setting up them hangout. And then I said something, I made like a really, really gross joke about like blowing him or uh -huh. something. Cause I thought it was going there. Right. And then he blocked me. Whoa. And blocked me on Twitter. Whoa. Blocked me on everything. Wow. Deleted every tweet he had sent me. And I was just like, I went too far. <laughs> wow. We never talked about it. And then I met him three years later and it was cool. And now it's like this weird thing where we're friends, but I want to be like, were you trying to fuck me? Yeah. Also, were you like, were you trying to get, catch a predator? Like, what was happening? Yeah, what was going on? I don't know. Various other videos uh, would surface of Shane Dawson making sexual comments around his 12-year-old cousin. A one-minute clip from Primink would gain almost a million views, showing Shane talking about periods, intercourse, and oral sex 
with a visibly uncomfortable child. <laughs> Wait, Lucy, let's get real. That's so embarrassing. We want to know. We have a question. What is it? Very important question. And you don't need to feel shy about it. Oh no, you really? <laughs> you it's really, natural. It's natural. Is there anybody around? No? It's natural for a girl at your age. <laughs> yeah. So we want to talk to you. We want to explain what sex so is to you. We did get yeah. real quiet. I oh, where's the other peep? We should probably oh, explain. Oh, yeah, we'll just use, we'll use peeps. Okay, well, one peep and then we'll use you. Oh. Okay, so <laughs> I'll just pretend like that's, you know, I mean, that works. Lucy, this happens. See, oh. <laughs> ah. And then, and then you're so happy when you're an adult. I can't believe I'm endorsing this. <laughs> Look what you've turned me into. You so, so Lucy, does that make sense? <laughs> Can you reenact it for us? <laughs> but Lucy, listen, you should be in love and you should preferably be married and hopefully not have any kids. Okay. And you should definitely be over the age of like 24, 25. And he should put a ring on it. A and he should put a ring on it. dick ring on it. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. No, you don't know what that is. You shouldn't know what that is. Okay. Now, are you on your period right Stop now? Stop it. What? I'm trying to get answers. I'm not gonna give you anything. So close. <laughs> How old are you? I'm twelve. She's this on is period, feels very. Right? No, what? Are you? No, you're not on your period. You bleed. No. Now listen. You have a boyfriend, right? Yeah. Now what did I tell you? When he says, "Can I put it in?" You say. No. Good. <laughs> High five, girlfriend. Now when he now when he says, "What about just in your mouth?" You say. No. No. You say I bite. <laughs> <laughs> In another clip, he asks her to shake your titties more, going into joke about having child molesters watching before asking her to eat a cocktail weenie in a sexually provocative manner. Good job, Lucy! But next time, shake your titties more. And you, take off the jacket and show more. Good job over there. Hey, what's up, you guys? So it is family day, and like every family day, it's full of emotional eating. And Lucy, I checked my statistics, and I have a lot of child molesters watching, so can you please eat a cocktail weenie? Do it slow. <laughs> oh. Oh, I like that chocolate, that weenie. Ooh, it tastes so good. Do like an Asian, like. Yeah. Another video shows Shane asking a girl on Omegle to twerk for him, with Ripzilla calling this predatory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love you too. Can you twerk for us? I know twerking is insane. <laughs> Oh, I love you too. Oh, I love you too. Now shut up and twerk. It's the best day ever. Oh my god. Maybe she can't hear us. Okay, wait. Okay, okay. Twerk for us. <laughs> oh, oh, here we go. She's going in front of us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. girl. <laughs> yeah. Now tell her to show herself. Stop it, Shane Lee. <laughs> love you. Oh. Here are various other clips of Shane talking to or about minors in an inappropriate manner. I'm so sweaty right now. Oh my god, can you guys see my pants? <laughs> you did, huh? I was like itching myself and I'm not wearing any pants. And then I got realized I was on camera. This is a bad idea. Anytime I do these tiny chats, I always say something or show something inappropriate. And then I went on and I was like, hey everybody, I'm doing this dick cam chat. And it was like all balls. It was like balls and eyes. Okay, eyes and balls. So what this bitch website should be called eyesandballs.com. <laughs> Eyes bulbs, balls and ear gouges. <laughs> Whatever the fuck they're called. Ear vaginas. That's the thing, like I get a lot of um like a lot of these young girls, like twelve, just, yeah. oh she have a cock in my mouth, like all this stuff. Um, okay. and and I see the <laughs> tweets and then I meet them in person and they'll like grab my butt and I'll hear them like I touched his ass oh I want him to fuck my pussy or whatever like what oh if a fan God. comes up and they're like 12 <laughs> it's about to get real they're like 12 and they're like oh Shane oh I want to fuck you fucking, fucking suck my dick and suck my pussy or whatever and then what if I looked at them and what if I was like alright I gave him a hotel key and I'm like let's fucking do it yeah, chill out Lacey Green Shane's here so okay. I lay I lay say it she lays down right mm -hmm. she's 12 Oh Imagine God. it, your twelve-year-old self. Go back oh in your my brain. God. Right? Uh, you were probably in love with what Joey Fatone. I feel like that's that that's a good match for me. Mm. I'm like the Joey Fatone of now. Like Justin Taylor hairy. Thomas. Joey wishes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So imagine like you're laying your 12 year old self and then a fucking hairy Shane Dawson with his fucking hairy man body, 26, 
<laughs> fucking crawls up on the bed and's like, all right, let me get my cock out. <laughs> like, that's the scariest thing. And that's the that's actually the grudge. That's the scariest thing in the whole world. Like, so I want I want these kids to know. Sex actually with me, the grudge. Sex with me is gross as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's disgusting. You don't oh want it. God. Stop asking for I mean- it. There are a plethora of screenshots of a website that Shane used to solicit images, asking fans to show me your orgasm face, blowjob face, creepy rape face, to an audience that he must, he must have known were underage. From Wikipedia, in November 2017, it was announced that full screen streaming service which Shane and friends had been broadcasting on since April 2016 would be shutting down in January 2018, halting production of the podcast for the time being. In March of 2019, after controversies surrounding Dawson's remarks in certain podcast episodes, all past episodes of the podcast were deleted from iTunes and SoundCloud, though many unofficial copies of the audio can be found online. Like, he kind of can... Listen, allegedly... He has this justification justification for pedophilia, and it's so disturbing, and, like, I I just pretend that he doesn't. (laughs) Okay, wait, no, no, let me explain, let me explain! Oh, God. Here's my justification for pedophilia. I can't. Okay, first of all, let me just say... Having sex with children or touching children or anything of that nature is terrible and you should not do it. But. (laughs) But. (laughs) But. Here's my thing. People have foot fetishes. People have fetishes about, you know, everything. And there's websites on the internet where they can look at that weird, creepy shit and jerk off to it. Okay, fine. Everybody do your thing. So why is it when somebody looks at a Google's like naked baby on Google and jerks off to it, they can get arrested? I don't understand that. Because. There's a naked baby because they had to because somebody took a picture of a naked baby. But and I they mean, don't and then by the way they're not googling naked baby they're googling like <laughs> I'm not gonna say what they're googling. I to Google and I'm like oh god I want to see you're gonna I don't get arrested. Wanna, I know but I didn't want to see child porn but I just wanted to see like okay let me just pretend let me pretend like I'm a pedophile for a sec. Okay by the way just for the record <laughs> police I have nothing to do with this I didn't know this like you can literally get arrested for saying I know this. Let, let me let me finish. So I typed in naked baby. First of all, I don't understand why anybody would be turned on by that. But... That's the first good thing you said. But... They were sexy. (laughs) (laughs) I'm kidding. Okay, back to the Instagram. Um, So, I look at this... Hi. Uh, I wanted to play that clip in full. I mean, that moment especially in full. (sighs) Just for context. Because that seems to be missing (laughs) nowadays. I cannot believe that I am having to make this video. I cannot believe that this is happening. I... uh, I'm gonna start by saying, I am not a fucking pedophile. I, Shane Yaw, my real name, go on record saying, I am not a fucking pedophile. Got it? Great. There's my statement. Is everybody saying, Shane, make a statement. There's my statement. I'm not a fucking pedophile. It's disgusting that people are saying I'm a fucking pedophile because of some shitty ass fucking jokes from six years ago on a podcast. (sighs) Hello, uh, future Bill here um, to give my thoughts, my final thoughts on uh, Shane Dawson's early career and controversy. I don't think Shane is actually a bad person. I think that his intent with his jokes is an important thing to think about. I think that they were pure, and I think that his intent was to make people laugh. Um, And obviously, comedy is subjective, and I'm sure there are people that laughed at them, otherwise he wouldn't have the fan base that he still has. But personally, uh, I find some of the jokes that he made extremely inappropriate, um, especially the ones uh, around around minors. Um, I think that some of the actions and comments that he has made around minors is is extremely inappropriate. Having said that, I don't think that he is uh, a predator. Not all the arguments in this video that I've presented are my own, um, but I hope that I've been able to provide an alternative point of view. Thank you for watching. I uh, I hope you've enjoyed. Um, I think you should definitely buy the uh, BWC merch. It's great. There's there's mugs and stuff. It's, it's awesome. Um, you can find me on Twitter at BillBaines underscore and on YouTube at Baines on Toast. I just gotta cut it there. I don't care.
It's no secret Jeffrey tried to disassociate with his past self when he built his new company. As optics go, it would be a PR nightmare to have that as the face of the brand. In fact, Jeffrey tried to erase things from his past. The early oral salvation interview was removed from public at the request of Jeffrey, and the host Mitch obliged. This kind of cleanup was somewhat successful, removing interviews such as this one, cleaning old social media accounts, and the natural test of time put a veil over who Jeffrey was. He didn't attempt to make any statement of change during his transition to the new industry, and the community he was about to enter mostly didn't know who he was. He was just a man who wore makeup, had a short, wild music career, and is now settling down to enter the cosmetics industry and create new products for millions of people. It didn't take long for Jeffrey to make a name for himself again, and he rose through the ranks on YouTube at the same time his company expanded. Through 2015 and into 2016, he had made his way into the beauty community and was seen as someone with a voice to be heard when it comes to the products in the market. However, this also represented an issue for Jeffrey, which would soon come back to bite him, and that is his aggressive personality and controversial nature. In April of 2016, Kylie Jenner released a new lip gloss which Jeffrey had picked up. However, Jeffrey received a faulty product and so he publicly criticised her for a lack of quality control and shared tweets that other people had put out of their experience. This resulted in Kylie apologising and a company replacing all of the faulty products at no extra fee. A month after, he was interviewed and had some words to say. You made a huge statement when you criticised Kylie's lip gloss. Did you ever end up talking to her or did she reach out to you? If the product didn't suck, I wouldn't have anything to say. I was just being honest and I had no idea it was going to get so big. I was just giving my honest review. She tweeted me some half assed response like, I care about the industry too, with a heart, and I was like, you didn't address anything I said. Typical. Editorial note, her exact tweet was, I have the same passion. Do you think she spent enough time researching the formulas for all her lip products? No. I can really say no without you finishing the sentence. No. She found a lab that makes a $5 formula and the called Colourpop. Editorial note, this is a common theory, though it's never been officially confirmed or denied. She has been seen on social media in the lab with the founder of Colourpop. They gave her the same exact one with her name on it and charged $20 more. I am bored. Ha 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 ha. The criticism of the product was fair. There was a severe and systematic issue with the release of it. However, to then go ahead and speculate how her entire range is formulated and its value is just throwing around accusations with no substance. Which, of course, is something he will very much be exposed for in quite literally the same month he said this in the interview. I don't even know where to begin. This is Rocky Roadkill. He's actually a fan of Jeffrey, and in May he went to DragCon in LA to see Jeffy Boy and also pick up an early access release of Jeffrey's new Skin Frost highlighters. He also has a YouTube channel focused on makeup, so as all makeup YouTubers do, he goes ahead to review the new product. But there's one issue. His product is faulty. And right when I picked it up, just to look at myself, it fell out and fucking broke into thousands of pieces. Although upset, he does mention that he liked the product and had already contacted customer service to receive a replacement for it. It was a positive, albeit rather emotional opinion on the product, but Jeffrey didn't see it that way. He commented on the video accusing Rocky Roadkill of making slanderous claims and doing it only for views and attention. He claims that the customer service team never received a complaint from him and that if he had just contacted them, it would have been sorted. There was no need for this video. What's even better is he then threatens to contact YouTube about this defamation. Legal note, that's not how it works. In fact, according to Rocky Roadkill, Jeffrey Stans attacked him for his video, said he was lying that he did the damage himself, and this is apparently what spurred Jeffrey to respond the exact same way. Typical. He even went ahead and blocked Rocky Roadkill across all his socials, as well as the Jeffree Star Cosmetics accounts. That is the response of a petulant man-child. But it just gets worse for Jeffrey. Come the time the product actually released, would you believe it that other people started to report the exact same issues with their products? He shipped out his um, skin frost and everyone received their packages and a bunch of people had broken highlighters, just like me. Jeffrey had, a month prior, 
criticized Kylie for defective products, and then went ahead and also threw more shade in an interview the month later. But when someone raises concerns about his products, it's the end of the world, and Rocky Roadkill was only doing this for attention. The projection is unreal. However, after people started making noise, Jeffrey responded, not in a tweet, not in a video, but in the comments of Rocky Roadkill's video. Although he did later release a video reading his comments after he deleted it because of harassment. Basically, Jeffrey's response was a comment taking absolutely no responsibilities for his actions and blaming other people for influencing them. It also exposed Jeffrey's lack of quality assurance, not checking the products when they left his warehouse, something that should always happen, and again, taking no responsibility. Although this was a slightly different circumstance, it was extremely hypocritical of Jeffrey to go ahead and accuse Rocky of lying and responding so poorly to the criticism when he had literally just done the exact same to Kylie. Not a good look, and it wasn't until Jeffrey's shit staring would come back to cause him problems, as yet another month later, he found himself in more trouble. At this point, people were starting to realize who Jeffrey was and all of the things that he'd done in the past that would raise questions about the ethics of supporting his brand. Just as his company was entering a critical stage of its progression, a respected beauty YouTuber released a review of his products that would unleash a firestorm that would test Jeffrey and his brand. Today's video is my review on the Jeffree Star Beauty Killer palette as well as the Skin Frost. At the end of this video, I'm going to discuss my feelings on this brand as a whole as well as touch on some recent controversies and past controversies. It may not matter to some people, but it matters to me who I buy from and support and I know it does matter to some other people as well. In the video, Stephanie Nicole pulls up certain issues she has with Jeffrey, and it includes links to things from Jeffrey's earlier days as seen before. The impact was felt by Jeffrey as people started to question him and his nature, leading to another character from his past speaking up and joining in on the party. Kat Von D, the tattoo artist and a longtime friend of Jeffrey, released a statement on Instagram distancing herself from Jeffrey. She then released a 14 minute YouTube expose covering how she thinks he's a douchebag, as well as revealing that he had not paid her friend BJ Betts for the concept designs he had created for Jeffrey's brand's logo. But like, you can see like different variations of the star. And then like if you um, like zoom in on this one in particular, where you see it was a J and then an S, and then you see this little circular thing around this side here. These, this was the preliminary sketch for the logo that Jeffrey uses now. And uh, as you could tell, it was a J and an S before. Jeffrey responded rather swiftly, branding her video as lies and propaganda on Snapchat. She responded with a tweet saying he was lying, stating that he had reached out to BJ only an hour after her video. He then clapped back with a screenshot of their messages, then he dropped the video. Hey everyone, so today's video is a really hard one for me to make. I have sat here for, we're on day two now, since Kat posted her video about me. So he says he had finally paid bets, however his excuse was that he didn't pay at the time because he couldn't afford to. But this is far from the point, because he didn't actually pay anyone else to create the designs. The person who eventually vectorized his designs said himself that he was hired just to vectorize the concepts that Jeffrey gave to him. The concepts made by BJ were far too similar to the final design for it to be a coincidence, so Jeffrey, somewhere along the line, made the conscious decision to use these designs and not attempt to reimburse the person who had created it. This is blatant after the fact, because when he was called out on this, he quickly acted to settle the issue in private, ending the short feud for the time being. However, he still holds a resentment towards her for this. Even though me and that dumb whore aren't friends anymore, I still yeah. appreciate her artwork. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> Is that like hard for you to look at her artwork on your no, body forever and you're no. like, No, I mean, more. when you're friends with someone for 10 years, you have so many amazing memories. Um, you know, and she got jealous and weird and tried to backstab me in front of the internet and failed, and I'm still here. One consideration from this conflict is that the original issue started because of another creator's personal rejection of Jeffrey as a person due to his past actions, and this had led to him bleeding subscribers. The Kat Von D feud was a side piece to this drama, yet it took the main spotlight and effectively nullified the criticism levied at Jeffrey for his past. He didn't respond to Stephanie Nicole, and once he had clapped back with Kat Von D, the attention towards his racist comments and discriminatory behavior seemingly dissipated, which was soon going to come back and cause much more grief. But before then, he would continue feuding and causing controversy. Like in January of 2017, when a customer of Jeffree Star Cosmetics posted a photo on Twitter of, just wait for it, 
a skin frost highlight with a hair in it. Of course, makeup is not supposed to have any foreign material contained in it, just ask Jaclyn Hill about that, so rightfully they complained to customer service. It took more than 24 hours for a response, but it took minutes for an Instagram post to catch the attention and make them offer a refund. This time discrepancy is a valid criticism of the company. However, Jeffrey doesn't like criticism, blocking the customer and then subtweeting them in the replies of a fan's tweet. What's worse is that the tweet he replied to was making the accusation that this person was lying about the product, saying it was fake, and then Jeffrey willfully accepted this accusation and slighted the girl who just wanted hairless makeup. So of course they didn't enjoy that and tweeted out his response, which caught a lot of people's attention. So he resulted to accusing her of bullying him and then blocked her. A bit soft. Later in April, he would go and find himself in more controversy by releasing an expose on another cosmetics company, Too Faced. He released a video revealing the truth about the industry and how a lot of the time creators make significantly less than the brand does in collaborations. Um, like I recently just exposed the whole Too Faced Nikki tutorials thing where she really only got 50k um, to do this huge collab with the brand and they were in Sephora and Ulta and they made, you know, like $10 million off of her and she got nothing. So she made about 25K and Too Faced made 10 million. It's horrible. That's horrible. And a lot of people in the makeup, like behind the scenes are like so devastated and horrified that I exposed it. But I think that the audience in YouTube and always, I mean, we're talking about millions of views now. This isn't some little thing we're doing, you know, where 10 people are watching. It's like, if you're invested into this world and you know everything and you're supporting all these brands, you should know who you're supporting. Mm -hmm. Doubt and they're very... Obviously, they're angry because the truth is exposed. Right. Um, and, you know, instead of making a statement, they decided to just shade me and start liking all these comments on Instagram calling me ugly. And I'm like, the what? Only, uh, it's 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 very childish. That's just a business owner. Like, why wow. would you? And no offense, I'm not, you know, that to your brand. someone's going to say I'm age shaming. The owner is over 45 years old and you're like liking comments calling me ugly and dumb. It's so like high school. Juvenile. Yeah. So, you know, like when me and Manny collabed, he, you know, he made a lot of money. Because I'm very fair and we did an amazing fair deal. Yeah. Um, you know, so a lot of these YouTubers are doing brand deals or they're collabing and I don't think the business is in order. The subtle plug of his own company is hilarious, boasting about how much Manny Moore made in his collab with Jeffrey. But that is also overshadowed by the blatant hypocrisy in calling the owner of Too Faced unprofessional. In the build up to this conflict, he had done this exact thing to a paying customer, going as far to suggest she was lying. He blew up at Rocky Roadkill because he complained about a broken product. It's starting to seem that Jeffrey just can't handle people talking about him in a negative way because instead of assessing the situation, he instinctively reacts and does things that are just as bad, if not worse, than the people he is reacting to. He's transitioned his street brawling antics to the digital world and it just doesn't look good for him at this point. All of this drama would eventually reach breakpoints and the early signs of this appeared in April. I am not buying Jeffree Star cosmetic, at least not anytime soon. Manny and Jeffree's collab was very tempting. I love me some Manny MUA and the bundle itself looked bomb. This actually started about a year ago, a year and a half ago when I had snapped about seeing some Jeffree Star cosmetics on Chocolate Girls. I had seen no swatches and this was obviously a very popular brand and I got tons of feedback from you guys basically concerned and basically saying, you know, read into some of Jeffree's past. I'm not trying to make this open season on anybody. Jackie Anna makes the point that Jeffrey has been able to conduct his business in a community that is supposed to value diversity, while showing no signs of acknowledgement for why he, as a figure, challenges those values. Jeffrey's past was chaotic, it was filled with hateful language, and he had never attempted to make any sort of announcement to disavow that person. He just tried to hide it. But as with Stephanie Nicole, Jackie Aina brought this issue back into the spotlight, and this time, it made an impact. I feel like it's time that I get out a little bit more of my story. And this video is mainly about something that is a really fucked up subject that I've had to deal with for a long time. And it concerns old videos that um, were filmed of me 12 years ago. Racism, a 15 minute long video in response to the clips that resurfaced. Contrary to the title, the video does not discuss racism. Jeffrey was responding to the claims that he was racist, however, instead of taking accountability for the past use of derogatory language, racial stereotyping and toxicity, of which is not referenced in the video, Jeffrey disavowed his past self. He is adamant that he is not that person. That is not him. He doesn't know who that is. Well, it wasn't. 
but it's way easier to state that you've changed rather than taking accountability and explaining how you understand why people are concerned about your character. But that's too hard. Pushing the issue away as a past problem just ignores the fact that his entire brand was built on that person. So if he suggests he doesn't know who he was, then what does that make of him now? I know what I need to work on and fighting with people online and all this bullshit is so unhealthy and it's something that I'm going to completely stop. Although his apology lacked any real apology, he was just sorry he was caught. The video was positively received. At the time, most people still don't know Jeffrey or who he was, so it's understandable for why people were somewhat indifferent. However, there are some contextual elements that, when looking back now, make this video look utterly awful. He conquered this continent. One people, one nation, and immigration! 2017 was a very heated year when it comes to political extremism, as there was a white nationalist movement brewing in the states. When you look at the hate white nationalists have for people of colour, it's rather jarring for Jeffrey to release a video titled Racism, and for him to use that just to excuse himself because he had done all of that in the past. Keeping in mind these are just the things that were made public, we have no idea what he had done or said in private. It was a weekend of street battles and stark displays of racism, exploding into a deadly act of domestic terror. In Charlottesville, Virginia, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence and chaos. It wasn't until August that the Unite the Right movement reached its boiling point, resulting in the murder of a protester. So for Jeffrey to drop his video within this time period without making any effort to show some idea of what racism looks like makes the attempt at clearing his name so poor and his image was put on strings which was truly tested the same month. It's a pretty familiar story. Jeffrey criticizes another person for the quality of their product, and then this person responds saying that they'll do better. However, there was a difference. People were calling Jeffrey out, so Kim jumped to his defense. And guys, I see that my fans are totally hating on someone like Jeffree Star for being, you know, honest about my struggle swatches. <laughs> guys, like, and I see you being Should so stop right here. bringing up things in his past where he, you know, was, you know, negative, but he's also apologized for those things. And I get it's a serious deal if you say like racial things, but I do believe in people changing. I do not defend people that are racist and I'm very against it. But if someone claims that they have changed, I would Stop. I don't defend racist, but I just defended a racist. <laughs> this received a lot of backlash because people made it very clear that Jeffrey is someone that she should not be defending, so she repealed her defense. I do want to really apologize for me feeling like I had the right to say, <laughs> get over it in a situation that involves racism. And I just don't really feel like I have the right to speak on that. And I really, really, really am sorry. And I just, from the bottom of my heart, I was, and I've always been about just like positivity oh and I've never oh just been a negative person. God. So positivity. my thing is like, hey guys, I don't want to see negativity in my time. Can you imagine being in a room with her and Kanye oh talking like this? God. It was at this point that Jeffrey had arguably received his biggest blow. People were starting to talk about Jeffrey, his past, and questioning whether he'd really changed. With the short time he'd spent rising through YouTube ranks, he had always found himself in some sort of controversy that simultaneously sculpted and damaged his brand. On one hand, he is a successful entrepreneur who had supposedly risked it all to fulfill his dreams, and he creates a reliable product that allows other people to practice what they enjoy. However, on the other hand, he represents a figure of deception, snaking his way into a community unaware of who he was, and when called upon to correct the record, made no attempts to apologize for why his actions were so harmful. Thus, the noise would only grow louder and louder. The foundations had started to crumble. He needed to find a way out, and soon. So he calls on a friend. work on your side, 
saying that I'm loving the drama because it's improving sales. That's not the case. You're my family. I love you still. This is not about money. Take the time to think about your words and the impact that they may have on others because I assure you and I promise you, it's a lot stronger than what you may think. I am done with the tea, with the drama, and I don't want to be involved in anyone's situations anymore. The sky was